I name this lecture the end of osteoporosis because I do believe that this is one disease we can wipe out completely. In the next minute, you will begin learning about the infamous definition of osteoporosis and osteopenia, the dangers of bone medications, why milk and calcium supplements weaken our bones, the diet for strong, healthy bones, the right kind of exercise to prevent fractures, and the problems with recommendations given by national health organizations. And we'll cover a few other topics as we move along. So let's get started. Every year, millions of people have a bone density scan and are falsely diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis. They are then recommended to take very dangerous supplements and medications that actually increase their risk for hip fractures. And all of this can be easily avoided, if only we were just a little bit more educated. My goal is to help you clearly understand the full context of these issues, to take away the fear of osteoporosis, and to equip you with the information that you need to have strong, healthy bones for the rest of your life. Alright, to begin, let's make one thing crystal clear. Osteoporosis is not just a woman's disease. In the United States, 30% of all men over 50 will have an osteoporosis-related fracture. And in other cultures around the world, men have an equal or even a greater risk for bone fractures than women do. And we'll talk about why these differences exist later in this lecture. But for now, the take-home point is that osteoporosis affects both sexes. Even though today I'll be placing more emphasis on women, because it's women that are more targeted than men and that suffer greatly from the consequences of poor medical treatment. Okay, now let's learn more about this disease and what it's really all about. First, you need to know that before the 1990s, a diagnosis of osteoporosis was only given when a person suffered from an unexplainable fracture. But in 1992, the World Health Organization held a meeting that was funded by none other than pharmaceutical companies. And in this meeting, they created a new definition for osteoporosis. And this new definition only looked at one thing, bone mineral density. And according to the new definition, paid for by the drug companies, you officially have osteoporosis if your bone density is 2.5 standard deviations below that of an average 30-year-old white woman. And that's regardless of your age. You could be 80 years old, and be diagnosed with osteoporosis because your bone density is lower than that of a 30-year-old. If you're thinking that this makes no sense, I agree with you. It is absolutely normal for a woman's bone density to gradually decrease as she ages. At 80, or at 65, or even at 55, you should not have the same bone mineral density that you had when you were 30 and still in your reproductive years. Lower bone density is a normal biomarker of aging just like the new wrinkles you see on your face as you get older. But this new definition for osteoporosis is not as crazy as what this so-called panel of experts did next at that same meeting back in 1992. Near the end of the meeting, a question arose as to what to do with patients who were just on the fence and did not yet qualify for osteoporosis. And this is where the panel got extra creative. And by the way, the reports after the meeting tell us that it was a very hot room. They were all really tired and sweaty, wearing short sleeves, and wanted to hurry up, find a quick solution, and go home. So they quickly invented a new word, osteopenia. And that's when your bone mineral density is just one standard deviation below that of the average 30-year-old white woman. This new category automatically includes the majority of all women over 50. All women. But to be fair, those who were in attendance, including the chairman of the meeting himself, John Canis, have expressed that they never imagined that people would come to think of osteopenia as a disease in itself, or something that required treatment. They just wanted to create a category to help researchers classify patients. Members of this panel say that it was definitely not their intention to scare people into thinking that osteopenia was a disease of any sort. And to this day, doctors agree that the term osteopenia has no medical meaning. Dr. Robert Neer, who is the director of the Osteoporosis Center at Massachusetts General Hospital, tells us the problem comes from calling osteopenia a disease when it is not. And an even bigger problem is that many doctors ignore this very important detail and they continue to scare their patients. Saying to a 70-year-old woman that she has osteopenia is like telling her that she suffers from wrinklelosis 
because she has a few more wrinkles than a 30 year old. Wrinkleosis is a disease that I just invented a minute ago, just like osteopenia was invented at that meeting back in 1992. You see, I can be creative too. Wrinkleosis is a joke, it's my joke. We all know that a 70 year old naturally will have more wrinkles than a 30 year old. But osteopenia is not funny. Because ever since the new definition of osteoporosis and the fabrication of osteopenia, more than half of women over 50 have been frightened by an unnecessary diagnosis which has led doctors to over-medicate patients with dangerous drugs, ripping off taxpayers and enriching pharmaceutical companies in the process. And I see this happening all the time. Just a few weeks ago, a woman in her late 50s called me to set up a consultation to start exercising. And I told her that I would be sending her a form to fill out that would cover her medical history, lifestyle and so forth. She said to me over the phone, okay, I'll complete the form, but I just want to tell you now that I suffer from osteopenia. And I said to her, no problem, when you come for your physical assessment, we'll talk about it, we'll sit down and we'll discuss everything. So she shows up for her appointment last week and she's awesome. Her strength, endurance, balance, coordination, posture, body awareness are all that of somebody at least 20 years younger. But when we sit down to talk, she expresses her concern over her osteopenia diagnosis. And so I ask her, do you feel any pain or weakness in your bones? She says, no. Did you have a fracture? She says, no. Do you feel any limitations? Do you have any symptoms? No, no, she responds. But my doctor, Mr. So-and-so, diagnosed me with osteopenia. And so I had to explain to this client, as I've done several times before, and as I'm doing now in this video, that this diagnosis means absolutely nothing, except that it can make her feel afraid, it can make her feel anxious, and when you feel afraid and anxious, you begin to do silly things, such as accepting to take dangerous drugs and supplements that you don't need. And all of this because a meeting sponsored by drug companies in a sweaty room back in 1992 changed the definition of a disease and created a new one. This is just another perfect example of what we call checkbook science where it's all about big companies making a lot of money while harming a very gullible population. A New York Times article in 2003 summed it up best. In this article, Dr. Stephen R. Cummings, who is a leading osteoporosis researcher, noted that there is no basis whatsoever for using one standard deviation as the cutoff for osteopenia. As a consequence of this definition, he said, more than half of the population is told arbitrarily that they have a condition that they need to worry about. Now that we have some context, I want to switch gears and begin to talk about the dangers of bone medications that are often prescribed to women that are classified as suffering from osteopenia or osteoporosis. Now what you need to know is that bisphosphonates, such as Fosamax and Boniva, do not prevent fractures. Actually, orthopedic surgeons have reported the opposite, that these drugs increase the risk of fractures. And that's because they suppress bone remodeling, which is supposed to stop bone loss. But since the bone is not being renewed, it becomes brittle and ossified, and that's what leads to more fractures. And as if that wasn't enough, bisphosphonates have also been reported to increase the risk of irregular heartbeats, esophageal cancer, and osteonecrosis of the jaw, which means jawbone death which is why some dentists refuse to work on women who take these drugs. And this terrible list of side effects goes on and on. So it's not a surprise that there are currently over 5,000 lawsuits against Merck for their drug Fosamax, which has hurt many people. And yes, the victims are winning these cases. Just a few weeks ago, a woman was awarded over $8 million. And Merck was forced to change its Fosamax label to include an updated medication guide, and this was to reflect the risk of atypical femur fractures. And let me explain to you what an atypical femur fracture is. That's when you're standing around doing absolutely nothing when you notice that your thigh bone just breaks. And according to professor of orthopedic surgery, it looks like you're a victim of a car accident. A New York Times article called Drugs to Build Bones May Weaken Them reported that the thigh bones of patients on bisphosphonates have simply snapped while they were walking or standing after weeks or months of unexplained aching. Does this sound like a medication that you want to be on? And all this because we want to increase bone mineral density. After all, as we explained, the 1992 definition for osteoporosis places the emphasis squarely on bone density. But is that truly a good indicator as to whether or not you have strong healthy bones? 
does a lower than average bone mineral density automatically increase your risk for a fracture? And the answer is no, it doesn't. More than half of all women who experience an osteoporotic fracture do not, by definition, have osteoporosis or low bone density. In fact, there are some areas of the world where bone mineral density is lower than that of Western countries, but the fracture rate is also lower. So your take-home point is that bone mineral density on its own is not a good predictor for fractures. Bone density does not equal bone quality. But if you are still fascinated by your score, my advice to you is to pay more attention to the rate of change of your bone density rather than whether or not your score classifies you for osteoporosis. And if you notice a huge drop in your score, more than, than the normal decrease that happens over time, then you'll know something may be wrong. But the fact remains that in North America we do suffer from weak bones and hip fractures, more so than most other countries. But how can this be? After all, we do consume more calcium than anywhere else. We cannot discuss osteoporosis without talking about milk and calcium. The dairy industry spends millions of dollars per year in marketing to teach us one thing. Milk builds strong bones. And part of this budget is spent on communications with health professionals, programs in schools and universities, and for helping to develop health and food policy with government authorities. This is what it takes to brainwash the public into thinking that milk builds stronger bones. Now let me ask you, did you ever see a commercial for broccoli or for spinach? No. And do you know why the dairy industry has to spend so much money on advertising? Because it's been a well-documented fact in the global scientific community that countries consuming the most dairy have the weakest bones. So if you want osteoporosis, drink milk. Dr. Walter Willett is the chairman of the Department of Nutrition at Harvard University School of Public Health. And he does not want kids to drink milk. He teaches us that calcium and dairy are not the solution to osteoporosis. And he gives us the following amusing advice. If you care about your bone health, he says, and about preventing fractures, don't drink the milk, but take your cow for a walk. And I have to imagine that when some of you are hearing that the top people at Harvard University, along with the majority of other well-respected institutes from around the world, all telling you that the dairy industry has been lying to you, you might be thinking, oh my goodness, I thought that what Mark was talking about in this lecture just represents what a few hippie alternative scientists have to say. And that's actually the exact opposite. Because what I'm teaching you right now is an accurate representation of what the majority of the scientific community understands about osteoporosis compared to the marketing and the advertising from the dairy and pharmaceutical industries that many people, including many of you, confuse with legitimate science. If you get your health information from news headlines and magazine articles or the ticker at the bottom of your TV screen, then you are in trouble. Don't be fooled by the misrepresentation of science because unless there is money to be made for an industry, it is rare that you will hear about a study unless you actively search for it yourself. And it's often very hard and confusing for people to do their own research because they don't know that even nonprofit health agencies and national health organizations that appear to be credible sources of information are often funded and sometimes even entirely created by big food or pharmaceutical companies. Let me give you an example. A few years ago, the American Diabetes Association had a multi-million dollar deal with one of the largest soft drink manufacturers in the world. And of course, the American Diabetes Association denied that sugar consumption had anything at all to do with diabetes. So you really have to be educated to understand how to separate legitimate science from advertising. And that's especially hard to do when advertising utilizes science. So that's why I teach my clients to always look at the preponderance of the scientific evidence and not just one isolated study that comes to you paid for by the food and drug industries. So let's get back to our main topic and where we left off you might have been wondering why doesn't the calcium in milk build our bones? After all, isn't bone composed largely of calcium? Yes it is. And so isn't calcium essential for the development and maintenance of healthy bone? Yes it is. 
But just like everything else in nutrition, the mistake is looking at one nutrient in isolation. This is what one of the greatest nutritional scientists of our time, Dr. Colin Campbell, calls a reductionist approach to nutrition. And some of you are slapping their heads right now saying, yes, I understand, Mark, stop talking, I get this. That's why I take my vitamin D supplement. Or that's why I take my magnesium supplement with my calcium. But there you go again, still looking at a very small part of the whole picture because every bite of real food, such as spinach, contains not just one or two nutrients that we are obsessed with, but over a thousand nutrients working together in synergy to feed your body appropriately. Reducing all this magic down to just a few nutrients like calcium and magnesium is like reducing a huge orchestra down to a single instrument. It's not just about calcium. Because in North America, we do calcium all the time. We drink cow's milk, we love yogurt and ice cream, and we put cheese on almost everything. We, we even put cheese inside the crust of pizza. And then we believe it when we are told that we aren't getting enough calcium. So we go out and we buy calcium supplements to top it off. Just how brainwashed are we? And I teach my clients that whenever they put something in their mouth, specifically when it's a supplement, uh, because, you know, the supplement industry is a little brother of the drug industry. So I teach them that when they put something in there, they should understand what it's made of and what exactly they're doing to themselves. Because calcium supplements are often composed of chalk or eggshells. And that's right, you could be consuming chalk. The same stuff you use to write on a blackboard. And even more worrisome is the fact that calcium supplementation is associated with serious health risks, such as cardiovascular disease. And recent studies are finding that it may even increase the risk of hip fractures. In February of this year, 2013, the United States Preventative Task Force, after reviewing 135 studies, recommended against supplemental calcium. The preponderance of the evidence shows us that there's no benefit to calcium supplementation and many risks. It's not a good investment. Next, let's discuss why cow's milk, like all other animal protein, actually weakens our bone. Bones serve as a nutrient reservoir. This means that when we're running low on certain minerals, nutrients are drawn from our bones to compensate. Now here's the thing. Animal protein, such as that in milk, increases the body's acidity level. This means that when we consume animal protein, our blood and tissues become more acidic. So our body now must find a way to neutralize this acid and put out the fire. And calcium is the great neutralizer. But where does this calcium come from? And you guessed it, it's pulled from our bones and the result is thinner, weaker bones. On one hand, you see how beautiful our human body is, always looking to maintain balance. But when you keep eating foods that result in high levels of acidity, you just keep challenging the balance, forcing your body to deal with it. And in this case, Osteoporosis ensues as a long-term effect of such repeated, short-term, positive coping processes. And to make this point even clearer, imagine trying to fill a bucket of water when the bucket has a hole at the bottom. It doesn't matter how much water you put into that bucket, you will never fill it. The same way that no amount of calcium will compensate for a diet that consistently increases the acid load in the body, forcing the bone to give up its calcium. Dr. Colin Campbell writes that when animal protein increases metabolic acid and draws calcium from the bones, the amount of calcium in the urine is increased. This effect has been established for over 80 years. And that doubling protein intake, mostly animal-based, from 35 to 78 grams per day causes an alarming 50% increase in urinary calcium. So now we understand why research from the most respected universities show us that women with the highest ratio of animal to plant protein suffer from weaker bones and more fractures. Women eating a lot of animal protein have been found to lose bone almost four times as fast as those who consume a predominantly plant-based diet. And on a more positive note, a study from the University of California looked at 33 countries to determine that a high ratio of vegetable to animal protein consumption was found to be strongly associated with an almost complete disappearance of bone fractures. Yeah, you heard that right. Women who ate the least animal-based food and the more plant-based food had almost no fractures. But where do we get our calcium from if not from animal-based foods? The dairy industry will have you believe that milk is the best source of calcium. 
But the truth is that the best sources of calcium are plant-based foods, such as dark green leafy vegetables, sprouted beans, microgreens, and of course green juices are remarkable for health. Then we have the chia seeds, sesame seeds, and so on. And all of these foods not only contain rich amounts of calcium, but also all the other nutrient cofactors that are necessary for better absorption. Now let's look at a few numbers that often shock people that receive their nutrition education from the dairy industry. 100 grams of low-fat milk gives you 125 milligrams of calcium, 11 milligrams of magnesium, and 95 grams of phosphorus. 100 grams of chia seeds gives you 631 milligrams of calcium, 335 milligrams of magnesium, and 860 milligrams of phosphorus. And if you've received a bad education in nutrition, or haven't been listening to this video at all, you may say something silly such as, but it's a lot easier and a lot fewer calories to drink 100 grams of milk than to consume 100 grams of chia seeds or sesame seeds, so it's a lot easier to get the amount of calcium I need through dairy. And the people who say this are the ones that still believe in the recommended daily calcium requirements, which is now at something crazy like a thousand milligrams. And they're still sticking to their reductionist approach to nutrition. It's time for them to open their minds and realize they've received a bad education. When you consume some of the plant-based foods that I've just mentioned, you're not just getting calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus. You're also benefiting from an entire orchestra of important chemicals such as antioxidants that don't exist in animal-based foods, all working together in synergy to help your body better absorb and utilize nutrients, such as calcium. And this helps to build strong bones in the process. I mean, let's keep looking at chia seeds. These seeds provide us with essential fatty acids, fiber, minerals, vitamins, enzymes, phytochemicals, antioxidants. And if you sprout the chia seeds with your kid's chia pet, it, they're even better for you. Cow's milk, in comparison, contains no fiber, no antioxidants, animal protein, saturated fat, and cholesterol. Which source of calcium is a better investment for you? What if we spent millions of dollars a year advertising chia seeds instead of dairy? But unfortunately, there is no big business or money to support and publicize the foods that are high in calcium that we should be eating. And if you're wondering what to do with chia seeds, the community section of our website, which you can find at marcionutrition.com slash community, is it's free to join. And we do have a recipe, an ice cream recipe that's delicious, and we make it using chia seeds. Now, other than animal proteins, there are foods that we consume that also create acid conditions in the body that we may not be aware of. An animal-based diet is by far the worst culprit. Let's make that point straight. But other items, such as unripened fruit, contribute to bone loss as well. For example, if you live in Canada during the cold winter months, the fruits you buy, even if they're organic fruits, are shipped from far away and they're never picked ripe. And that's a problem. You should buy local organic fruit that was ripened and fell straight to the ground. In winter, reduce your consumption of fruit. Cooked tomatoes, such as tomato sauce, is also very acidic to the body. A raw organic tomato is fine. And then we have cooked processed grains that are a huge problem. I'm talking about all of these cereal boxes and breads. Even if they say 100% whole grain, that's a myth. And these foods rob minerals from your body. But if you take a truly natural whole grain and you sprout it, it becomes an alkaline food. And that's great for you. Moving away from food for a moment, we have to discuss the importance of weight training. Even a perfect diet for bone health, such as the one I teach my clients, will not make up for a sedentary lifestyle. Nothing helps to build strong, high-quality bones like resistance training. And you can greatly improve your bone health through weight training at any age, even in your 90s. I have clients in their 70s and 80s. And when I first begin to work with them, I focus on areas such as balance, agility, coordination, and muscle awareness. I basically train them so that they can avoid falls. And I've had 70-year-olds tell me that they've slipped on the ice but were able to stop themselves from falling due to our training. That's how you avoid fractures. And once I have them moving well with good mechanics and proper posture, I turn to heavy resistance training. And a lot of people think that's crazy to get an elderly person to do resistance training. 
And they are so terribly mistaken, because proper resistance training is how you remain functional for your entire life, and that's how you prevent osteoporosis. Ever notice how some older people can walk for hours without any problem at all? But these same people have a problem getting off the couch. Not if they're my clients, because I will work to improve their fast twitch muscle fibers and their explosiveness, so they can get up and down off the floor with their grandchildren, and they won't ever have to deal with weak bones. In the beginning of this lecture, I mentioned that North American women are more prone to developing bone issues than men are. And one of the reasons for this is the stereotype that women should not lift heavy weights, the very thing that ensures strong bones. And then in this culture, we have a fixation with thin is beautiful, women can never be too thin. And when they go on low calorie, poor nutrient diets, their bones are robbed of precious minerals. So called high protein, low carb diets are a recipe for disaster, especially when the only exercise you do is cardiovascular. Finally, there is the importance of getting the proper amount of sunlight. And if you live somewhere very cold during the winter months, you can take a whole food, 100% natural vitamin D supplement. Stay away from synthetic supplements that do more harm than good. And even if it's cold sometimes, try to get out and get some natural light, because nothing's going to replace that. You see, if you follow our recommendations, osteoporosis will never be an issue in your life. Proper whole food, plant-based nutrition, with as much raw food as possible, resistance training, and a good amount of sunlight. That's the formula. You will never need dangerous drugs and supplements, and you won't need to spend the last years of your life in pain or confined to a wheelchair. But these recommendations don't make the headlines often enough. As an example, let's look at what is being advertised by Osteoporosis Canada. This is on the front page of their website. Here we see an article on the potential cancer risk with long-term use of calcitonin-containing drugs. These were medications for osteoporosis that researchers in Europe found to be quite dangerous, and that was in 2012. And Canada waited until July of 2013 to do something or say something about it. And if we scroll down the website, we find the next article which reads, Osteoporosis Canada congratulates the Manitoba government for providing access to a new osteoporosis medication. The medication in question is Zoldronic Acid, brand name Aclasta. And it's another bisphosphonate, like the ones we talked about earlier. And let's look at its side effects. And I'll read one of them for you. Being treated with a bisphosphonate medication such as Zoldronic Acid Injection for Osteoporosis may increase the risk that you will break your thigh bone, or bones. You may feel dull, aching pain in your hips, groin, or thighs for several weeks or months before the bones break. And you may find that one or both of your thigh bones have been broken even though you have not fallen or experienced other trauma. Now again, let's get back to the front page of the Osteoporosis Canada website. I'm still on the same page, and I'm scrolling down to find the next article. And this one says, A study links calcium intake to longer lifespans. First of all, you must be wondering why is a longevity study featured on the front page of Osteoporosis Canada? Next, the headline is misleading because the study in question was about calcium supplementation, not calcium from food. And would you like to know who funded this poorly designed, highly misleading study? You guessed it. The Dairy Farmers of Canada, Merck Frost Canada, and Novartis are on that list. Is it a surprise that the dairy industry as well as the pharmaceutical companies funded such a poor observational study that supposedly shows that calcium supplementation leads to a longer life? And of course, this is a rebuttal to all the legitimate studies in recent years showing the exact opposite results including increased risk for cardiovascular events, especially heart attacks, stroke, and heart disease. As I've mentioned before, rule number one for interpreting a scientific study for yourself, if the business that sells a product pays for a study to be done on their product, learn that this is advertising, not science. Actually, it's what we call checkbook science, where if you can write a big check, you can get the results you want. And rule number two, Look at the preponderance of the scientific evidence, because a single study on its own can say almost anything any industry wants it to. That's why you have to look at all the evidence, not just a single badly designed study funded by big industry, which appears 
not by accident, on the Osteoporosis Canada website. And there you have it. I had to show you the front page of this website so that you can see for yourself the business of this disease, like all other diseases. It's all about drugs and supplements and making money. And I'm sure that if some of you had gone on this website before watching this video, you may have had a different opinion. You may have seen things differently. But now that you're more educated, you can understand what Osteoporosis Canada is all about. And if you're beginning to question who funds this organization, then I've done my job. Sometimes just using common sense is all you need. You don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to understand the information I've presented to you in this video and how the financial interests of big business can ruin your health unless you get educated. I want to end this lecture with the most important point of all. And if I could reach across the screen and grab you by your neck and pull you in closer to make sure that you are listening, I would do it. I want you to think of someone that is suffering from osteoporosis. Is that the only health problem this person has? Maybe it's you. So tell me, is this the only health concern you have? And the answer is no. These health issues do not exist in isolation. Because the same lifestyle, the same diet, and the same lack of proper exercise that leads to the weakening of your bones also damages the organ systems of the body. Your bone health is representative of your overall health. It's not a shock that breast cancer and osteoporosis tend to cluster together in the same areas of the world and even in the same individuals. So it's time for you to begin looking at your body as a whole Understanding that your lifestyle and the choices you make are the best indicators as to whether or not you encounter health problems. And above all, you need to be well educated to make the correct choices. So together, let's take responsibility for ourselves and put an end to osteoporosis. Thank you.